Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on the show kernel when programming for your touring artists presented by AJ Penn. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar is also going to be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And I'd like to introduce you to AJ Penn, the presenter for today's webinar. Since the early 1990s, AJ has worked in the lighting industry as a technician, programmer, and designer for feature films, corporate events, and television. Now focusing on live concert production design, AJ is currently working with One Republic and Josh Groban. Now I'm going to pass the mic over to you, AJ. Well, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Brad Schiller, for the two of you for inviting me to this. Thank you, Martin by Harmon, for putting on this whole series. Um, I just want to say to everyone out there, hey, if you like my haircut, thanks very much. I did it myself. If you think my haircut looks stupid, what do you expect? I did it myself. Okay, that's what Colbert must feel like during this pandemic, trying to tell jokes. Okay, no more jokes. <laughs> this webinar, I'm going to um, try to define what it is the show kernel is. And... Um, also why I chose that term. I'm also gonna describe how we create this show kernel for your artist, uh, why it's useful, how it evolved, uh, and apply it to a typical gig day using examples from, from the work I've done. Along the way, I'm hoping to drop uh, some useful programming tidbits. And in this case, I'll be speaking the language of Brand MA2, which is uh, a console that most of us know if you don't use this console, I'd love you to pay attention to some of these concepts and see how they might be accomplished on a HOG2 or a Vector or whatever people are using out there these days, because uh, they are more broad programming concepts, and often you can figure out the syntax to make these ideas work on your console. So why do I call it the show kernel? Excuse me, got to press the right button here. Why did I call it the show kernel? Well, the kernel is the part of the seed of a plant that contains all the DNA, all the information to make another plant. It's the seed and the DNA flows from it. You can take the seed and plant it in a different place and you get a plant. It might not be identical to the original because it's going to grow to fit that environment, like ivy crawling all over the, the bricks of an old building on a Harvard campus or something like that. It also can be trimmed back like a bonsai tree to fit within a certain circumstance. But that plant maintains its essence. It's still a stalk of corn. It's still a beautiful chrysanthemum. Likewise, the show kernel is, uh, it contains all the information that makes your show unique, that makes your artist's presentation live unique. It's a package. It's a bundle of intellectual property. And it's spread over documents like plots and lists, and most importantly, the, uh, the show file. Your lighting show file, all your lighting programming, and what happens during the show. So it's uh, consider the show kernel, this package that you're going to unpack in the next environment you work in. <clears throat> why has it evolved in my workflow, and why does this approach make sense? When you're working with an artist for <clears throat> any more than one gig, you're going to do the show in different venues. Um, how did this evolve? Uh, different venues. Well, we used to be on tour and we'd go to the same looking venue. You go to an arena and your trucks are filled with all your gear and you go and set up on more or less the same stage and take it down to the end of the night. Everything's the same. You brought everything with you. Well, nowadays we don't go on tour to sell records anymore we give away music to go on tour. So tour revenue is important in a very different way. And there's more revenue streams. Uh, the Honda Civic Tour, for instance, One Republic, they're not afraid to take sponsors anymore so that they can mount a larger production to show the fans. 
Uh, Josh Groban has a special set of wines that he's selling as part of his VIP package. That's another revenue stream. And of course, the tickets have gotten ridiculous. Uh, we'll see what happens post-COVID when we start doing shows again. But spending $750 to get a bowl seat for Justin Timberlake, I mean, that's how you reap the money for giving away your music for free. Uh, the live performance has now become a commodity. And unlike in the 70s and 80s and the 90s, there's no such thing as selling out anymore. Nobody cares about selling out. There was this concept when Neil Young wrote a song called This Notes For You, and uh, Kurt Cobain would be definitely rally railing against the establishment, while at the same time Michael Jackson was shilling for Coke. There was this, there was this divide, and you didn't want to be perceived to be uh, selling out. Um, well, nowadays, corporate events, private shows, these are an essential revenue stream. And the fans don't care. They gave away their eyeballs and their attention spans to advertising to get free stuff uh, at least a decade ago. So companies love to put these A-list celebrities, A-list uh, artists like One Republic, like Justin Timberlake, onto their corporate stages after they've done a week of meetings and stuff like that. So you have all these different circumstances. Also, we have the rise of festivals. Festivals, uh, you know, they were more popular in, in Europe before they started to really take hold in the States. Now, worldwide, every summer, there are festivals, there are big festivals, small festivals, EDM festivals, et cetera, et cetera. You might have some input as to what equipment is there. If you're the headliner, they might take your lighting plot and work from that, but you're generally having to go in and play your show on equipment that's ready, that's designed for anybody to use. So these are all different circumstances. Let's take a look at a typical month with One Republic. Here's our official calendar for November last year. On the 5th of November, we flew to San Diego to do a San Diego private on the, the, the 6th. I can't remember exactly where that was, but I did save the plot. I'll show you in a second. And then we flew home. Then the next week, we fly out to Vegas. We're doing a Vegas uh, private in, uh, I think it was in the Hard Rock, the last, one of the last shows there. Um, the, then we fly to Palm Springs and do a gig in the middle of the desert at Pappy and Harriet's. And then we fly to Dubai later in the month to do their air show. So this is all different circumstances, vastly different types of venues and stuff like that, and different rigs. Let's look at San Diego for a second. San Diego was on a, uh, a stage line, SL320 stage. I fortunately already have a document that has my lighting uh, rig already drawn on, on such a, a stage. Uh, and in this case, um, I usually designed with quantum profiles and washes, and they wanted to substitute my quantum profiles with Mac Encores. No big deal. And they couldn't fit as many lights, so it's a little bit smaller than my usual rig. But the kernel is still in there. Then we go to Poppy and Harriet's out in the middle of the desert. And this is what I have to go on. A napkin CAD drawing of some, someone went out there with a tape measure and tried to uh, figure out how big the stage actually was and then sent us a photograph. Well, uh, I worked with uh, Gallagher Staging. They came up with this cool roof and I had to rehang my lights in slightly different situations, different locations. Couldn't fit quite as many up in this smaller roof structure. And as you can see, the stage is really small. It's the smallest that these guys can fit on before we start getting rid of the risers. Um, <clears throat> still, the kernel grew into the circumstances, and I was able to both cut down and make larger to make it fit. And then here's a completely different example. In Saudi Arabia, we did the Riyadh Formula E. Uh, this was a festival-looking plot. We had to play it as it laid. And there was no input from our end as to who was, uh, what the design was going to be. Way more first pictures I have programmed in my show kernel. But it was easy to scale up and copy to all these extra lights that were in the, in the uh, wings. Um, there may have been different lights, more of them, and in different locations than I'm used to, but I could find that show kernel within this rig. Also, I was subbing myself. This was one show that I couldn't make it to. So I had to give all this information to another LD, my good friend Steve Baird, who has covered for me before. And because all this information was all compiled properly and he understood my workflow, it was easy for him to, on the day, perform the show and run the show with confidence without having to program the whole thing. So <clears throat> that brings us to 
what are the components that make up this show kernel and how do we create it? Well, the most, it's, think of it as your advanced package, they call it a rider sometimes. It's a list of essential elements that make your show what it is visually in the live environment. Things like the stage plot, that's the most obvious thing. Who's on the stage? Where do they go? Do they need a riser? Can they do without a riser? Does the piano have to move? You need to answer all these questions to know exactly what information you're going to send to another venue and what information you're going to draw from to make your show work in that venue. Um, <clears throat> essential staging and set pieces. You probably have a drum riser. Uh, at One Republic, we have these really cool LED risers you can see in the photograph there and an LED trimmed piano. Um, there are some staging elements that have to move from time to time. All these pieces of information need to be accounted for or uh, communicated in some way. You can see the inset there. I show this is where the LED rack is going to be. This is where I need data for my LED piano. A drum kit almost always ends up on a riser up center. It might move around. Are there uh, can the keyboards go on the floor or do they need a riser? These are all questions you have to answer to come up with the show kernel. Now, how do you get this information? Well, you do your homework. The band manager probably knows them best. If you can speak to the band, if you could have spoken to Brian Epstein, he would have told you what's going to go on stage for the Beatles. Um, also, stage manager, production manager, watching YouTube videos. Do they have an existing stage plot that you can reference? But backline techs, they're the ones. They're the guys, the people that know what's going on on stage. If you see my little shot of Josie here, he's got his uh, stanchion VIP roped off area. He's a very important guy. He knows what's going on stage. He knows what guitar needs to be on stage at what time. He knows when his guy is going to be standing at the microphone. He knows all kinds of other things that are going to move around the stage. If you find out from the backline guys what's happening, you'll be able to decide what needs to be lit what needs to be advanced. Finally, we, uh, once you've decided what there is to light, you have to come up with a lighting inventory and a lighting plot. I love programming with the Martin Quantum Profile and Quantum Wash. Martin has a whole bunch of other great fixtures, as do all the other manufacturers, but these two basic ones are really easy to say, these are the looks that I absolutely need. If I have a cooler light, maybe I can do that on the day, but I know that I can get a certain amount of looks out of these workhorses. They're, they sold well, they're all over the planet, and um, they're, they're easy to find. Uh, it's also a fixture that I would have access to. I work with a lot, of, a lot with Christy Lights. Uh, LED source is important to me in today's world now. The arc light, I think, is just going away the way of tungsten, and LED makes it so even between fixtures. If you're dealing with a reputable manufacturer and a high-quality LED source, that's half the battle these days. Um, <clears throat> once you've chosen that lighting inventory, you need to organize it, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, but we've got to talk about the lighting show file. This is where every look is stored and it represents the largest investment in time into the show kernel that I'm talking about. This is where you're going to spend your time, is putting together every look and then being able to go to the next venue and have those looks play back faithfully. Um, the show file contains programming for all of your essential fixtures, and you can add additional layers of fixtures. You can add groups of fixtures that are just for future use that are not designed to work on your bare minimum show, but maybe when you know you're getting extra stuff. For instance, you walk into a place and they have LED fixtures on uh, the most beautiful architectural inside of the theater you've ever seen, like the East Theater in LA. Well, if you have six or eight LED fixtures programmed into your queues that have nothing to do with any fixture you ever saw, you can translate that program instantly and have the whole place light up like it's you were programming for days. Um, <clears throat> so, how do we go about making this show file and how does it apply? What's a typical day? Again, I'm going to use Grand MA2 to, to illustrate these uh, programming techniques. Um, I said we're going to choose and organize the uh, lighting inventory. Here's a little blow up of my plot, and if you can read, I have each 
fixture has a name. It's a moving light that says Brent Backs. So that's Brent's backlight. And then there's Ox Profiles. They're designed to work as part of a group. And then there's General Wash. They're designed to work as part of a group. Um, moving lights are great because they can accomplish many tasks, but not every place has 100% moving lights. You might have to do shows in theaters. Um, giving a function, conversely, to a moving light doesn't mean that's the only thing it can do. It's just giving it a primary reason for being on the plot in the first place. Let's look at the fixture schedule. This is a familiar view to anyone who works on, on, uh, on a MA2. You have your fixture layers and then use those fixtures. Well, the key here is to organize your fixture schedule by task. I have a layer called 1R key light. And then if you look at where it's circled there, it says Drew key. Well, fixture number one is Drew's key light. That's all it does. It lights his front. It doesn't have to do anything else. As you go down the list there, you have groups, uh, audience, cars, in case you're dealing with a bunch of bar cans, backlights, auxiliary profiles. Let me get to those in a second. Um, you can program stuff that you, you only use once in a while, like uh, the acoustic layer that you see there. That's uh, a group of lights where I can pull off an acoustic uh, show where the guys aren't moving around and they're not playing to track or anything like that, but I just light them from front and back. I already have that sitting in my show file ready to go. Um, so some fixtures are very specific in their tasks. These two examples are lighting up my guys. They each have a front light and two back lights. Now, do those lights have to move? The front light might be replaced with a no-color Leco if that's all you have. Could you replace the backlight with an LED PAR? Well, in this case, my backlights do move in the show, but if they didn't, then the performers would still have backlight at the appropriate times. So you could turn some of these moving lights into just LED PARs if that's all you had. Other fixtures might work as part of a group. You can see our classic uh, tight X's there and some lights shooting up over their heads, uh, the floor lights there, and then a group of wash lights just giving you a general wash. These lights, I could thin their ranks quite easily. Let's have a look at the uh, aux profile layer. Instead of having names of people that they're pointing at, they're sort of the location as far as how far off stage they are, auxiliary downstage with a bunch of arrows. I could thin these ranks out. I could eliminate half of the lights in this layer and they would still behave as a group they'd still swing out of the audience and chase and do all sorts of cool stuff they're designed to work as a group you avoid the problem where if i cloned my backlights on the guys on the on the band and if i took that cloning and used it to program a bunch of lights that were out in the wings as decoration at a festival, you might have that one look where the, just the one light at the piano for the whole song. And now you have every sixth light in the venue is just pointing off into nowhere because it was designed for something else. If you clone from a uh, group of fixtures that are designed to work as a group, you can clone to larger numbers, smaller numbers, whatever you need to do. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce the concept of this layout. Everyone uses layouts to varying degrees. Your show kernel should have a layout that basically mimics your plot more or less, or at least uh, arranges your lights into logical groups so that you get used to looking at your rig through this prism. You know where to reach to touch the wash lights and you know where the, how they're working in relation to each other. You can see their intensities in this particular view. You get used to selecting the same groups. Wash lights today will be the cloned wash lights when you go to your next venue. And you become accustomed to the broad strokes of your programming. Uh, a local show file might be available to you. And this is where you get to your place and you have someone's already given you a patch. Often this patch is organized uh, thusly by type or sometimes by physical location. You might have uh, uh, fixture, fixture layers that represent the different trusses. Um, it doesn't really matter. They've given you all this patch information that you can just suck into your show with a, with a, uh, a partial show read. So they've done a bunch of work for you. They might have even made their own layouts. Check this out. 
So this uh, show file was the Avalon Theater in Niagara Falls. My good friend Jeff Farrow helped me with this presentation, uh, by the way. Uh, he came up with this layout, and this is what he uses when he's grabbing lights in his venue. He's the house LD down there in uh, the Avalon. And uh, now I can sort of get a representation of where these fixtures are, and I didn't have to do all this work. And because it's a layout, it brought in the appropriate groups as well. So I can grab his group fixtures. And let's look how they relate. Now I can have a view where I have my original fixture, and I can choose right there where it's circled Brent's backlight. And then I can say, hey, this one's really close to this fixture in the guest layout. And it speeds up your process as to making the decision of which fixtures you're going to clone that day, which fixtures in the local rig are going to play the role of your original programming. So you clone by task. This is a familiar view to a lot of MA users, uh, the cloning view. And you can see how it lets you know that fixture 101 from your um, from your original is going to clone to this exact fixture here. It's really easy to see what's going to happen before you hit go on the clone. And you'll also notice if you look carefully here that my originals on the left hand side don't have any fixture numbers. And the incoming fixtures on the other side are all fixtures and don't have channel numbers. Watch what happens when you do your partial show read. When you select merge other, you get a very clean import. Now, if, you're, if either show is using different channel and fixture numbers for the same fixture, that's where it could get a bit weird. But uh, in this case, it allows you to bring in the guest rig and make all of today's fixtures fixture numbers as opposed to channels. Leave your originals as channels. It's time to get to work. Now I'm going to start talking about the process that you can use what's in the console already, i.e. the queue lists or sequences, to automate your day. And macros do this too. This big old start button here, I press that when I am ready. I've got the patch ready. I have control over the rig and I'm ready. I may have cloned already or I'm ready to start cloning. This puts my console into a state where I am on my test page and I'm ready to run my focus list. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, your original layout, let's look at that again. So this is where you're used to when you're programming, here's the light, here's the light, you know exactly, you're used to pressing these uh, areas of the screen to gain control of a certain light or select a certain group. What happens when you clone everything in and clone into the layouts? Well, boom, you get this more cluttered look and uh, it looks a bit cluttered, but it's actually quite logical. Now you've got a copy of each one of their lights on top of where you're used to seeing them in your layout, and it's got their fixture number. So even though it, the fixture number means nothing to you, his fixture number 17, I didn't call it 17, I called it something completely different. But you can say, hey, fixture 17 needs a look at, or something like that. You can communicate with the locals a lot easier that way. And if you use worlds, watch what happens. I can make everything disappear. This is the original world. We've cloned, so those other ones are sitting there waiting, but once I enter this world, again, that's a grand MA2 a programming concept. I'm not sure how that would work on another console, but it allows you to turn off, forget about, not be able to program with any of the other fixtures that aren't in this world. This world's made up entirely of channels, as for my channel fixture uh, trick earlier. Uh, and uh, we've gone from the full world to just the original world, and now you can create a today world. I have a macro that unlocks the today world. I lock those worlds so I don't accidentally screw them up. But my macro to create the today world will unlock it, take all the fixture numbers, again, anything that's a fixture number is a today fixture, store it, re-record it, now I have my today world. And you can see all the originals have disappeared and I'm looking at just these fixtures that I have in front of me on the day. If you go back into the full world though and select your floor lights, you will have selected today's floor lights and yesterday's floor and, and the original floor lights. This is great because you can make programming changes that will continue forward. Even though you're programming on a foreign rig, 
If you're in the full world and hit a certain group, you're going to grab all those fixtures. You're going to enter programming into those queues for those fixtures. The logic breaks down a little bit when you're trying to do very specific effects with timings and stuff like that. But if you just need backlights, come on in the chorus, that programming can be achieved and carried forward. And finally, presets, presets, presets. Anyone who has taught anyone to program for a tour says you have to use presets. Stay away from those hard values. The preset is something you can update throughout the entire show. I take this a step further and say, he is be parsimonious with these um, presets. Use as few as you actually need, just the essential ones. Um, this layout contains pretty much all of the presets I need to program myself through a song. There's a few extra presets that I might have to uh, look at a different view to find, but how many gobos do you need? I have a thick one and a thin one. They're going to be different when I'm going to different um, fixtures all over the world. Unless I'm doing a lot of projections on a backdrop where I have different gobo looks, I'm either breaking up into thin beams or, thin be or, or thick beams. The colors. Now, I'm going to mention Paul Rutherford's uh, webinar on the color theory. I thought it was fantastic. Taught us how our eyes perceive color. Taught us about how you choose colors for songs and stuff like that. Personally, I think that you want to limit your color palette for any given show. It gives your show a distinctive look and a theme. You can always add more um, more presets if you need them, but don't let dozens of preset default presets become your, your, your default. The more presets you make, the more they will the more you work you have on the day at your gig. And will those presets translate well to different fixtures? <clears throat> the primary function that I was speaking about for all of these fixtures can be living in a handy dandy base queue. I differentiate the base queue from like a fixture library default, whereas you just take your fixtures, you have a queue running below all of the other processes that has um, all of your fixtures pointing at their primary location, perhaps with a specific beam size, and maybe in the a, in a default color. Maybe there are no color, maybe you put some of them in blue. This way, you bring up those lights and they're doing their primary function. And it allows you to instantly see, like in that base queue, you would have open shutter program, for instance. Um, and that way, as soon as you run that base queue, you'll know if that open shutter queue has them blinking and you've got to update a strobe channel for one of your fixtures. Um, okay, so the next little programming trick I want to drop on you, and you can do this with any console, Create a focus list. Again, we're using the function of the console to automate our day. The focus list will act as a, a checklist for positions. If you get through this list, you know all of your position presets are updated. This first queue, for instance, is the sort of a calibration queue I have. <clears throat> if I run this queue and all the lights point towards downstage right or upstage left if it's a floor light and they're in blue and they're in a narrow beam, I know I've got those fixtures more or less cloned right. I have a starting point. Um, here you can see if they're pointing to the opposite side of the stage, you just go in the fixture patch and invert their pans. Now they'll be moving where you want them to. Uh, likewise, the MA has the ability to do like a, a 90 degree offset uh, if you're just pointing in the wrong direction. Um, <clears throat> I like to run this queue before I do my cloning. I've decided which cloning, which, which fixtures I'm going to clone to, but then as I clone each layer and get each task cloned in, the lights will all jump into this and I'll see right away. If they're on and blue and pointing downstage right, I got that layer perfect. Um, the command column on the, it allows you to, uh, you know, run some, some Command line queues. So each one of these queues in the focus sequence clears the programmer and selects the lights that you're about to focus. So if you have highlight on, for instance, it'll grab all your lights, throw them in white. You can hit next, next, next. The queue itself has those particular lights in the position that you want to update on and in blue. 
and you can make that anything you want. It just gives you that in context. This is what it's supposed to look like. There you go. Also, uh, in this example of my washes, these, this general wash, I want to create a nice even wash from behind over the whole stage. But I might want to check it again. You see I have this queue called wash primary beams. I like to make sure that it looks like a nice little ACL fan if you tighten up all those beams. So you can double check that as well. The key is you have this list that's reminding you to do all these things. And if you finish the list and its list is exhaust and the list is exhaustive, you're ready to do the show for sure. It doesn't apply for just the precision presets. You can use it to do all the other things. Uh, you'll notice that this list is selecting a group called check profile. And I can re-record that group. Let's say I have asked for quantum profiles and I get a mix of Mac 2Ks and Viper profiles. I'm going to have to go through this list twice to uh, compensate for differences in the color flags and different gobos and different values for that. So if I change, if I re-record that check profile group, each time I look at the next position or the next uh, preset, then it'll select a certain different group that I'm concerning myself with at the moment. And you might need to run through this list two or three times if you have several different fixture types. Um, so for instance, this queue that I showed you there, it checks the beam sizes. Iris down, da, 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 looks good. You can just hit update, move on. You can check your, your gobos and make sure that they're stopped and not wiggling. Uh, and then you can check with more cues, you can check their rotation speeds. And of course you can check your color. Here's one of my favorite colors that I call dirt, this bastard amber that's kind of like my lovely grungy color. Every light makes it slightly different. So if I'm running through these lights, I can quickly make an update and that preset's done. You can take up the least amount of programming time and it leaves you more time to deal with something specific that might be happening at that venue. Is there a special song that they're going to do that you have to program? Is there some weird handoff you got to figure out? Is there a bunch of extra lights that you do want to do some programming on? The more you have your kernel ready to go, the more you have time you have to deal with the gig at hand. Okay. So I hope this is all making sense. Now I'm going to get into a real world example where using the kernel uh, protocol, if you will, made it very easy to do two artists for three nights back to back at Red Rocks last summer. I've, it's a once in a career feat of scheduling that we had two shows with One Republic followed by one show with Josh Groban back to back at Red Rocks and both artists wanted to use the entire Colorado Symphony Orchestra. In Josh's case, this was pretty easy. We were adding, just tripling the size of the orchestra he would get locally every day. For One Republic, it meant adding programming for an entire orchestra to the entire show. But to save time and money, and labor costs, designing one rig to cover both artists and allow them to look completely different from each other was, was the task. So basically, we ended up, uh, I had show kernels for both. They were similar in that each had six primary positions. Uh, Josh's was different because he had that extra element of the orchestra already in there. They both had programming for, for uh, background layers. And Josh, Josh had a really cool backdrop uh, made of uh, surgical tubes that we lit up with X-bars. There was programming for that. And that was information that I could clone to different rocks. I added all sorts of extra lights to the rocks at Red Rocks as well as the ones that they have in-house there. Um, and uh, my background programming layers gave me programming for both artists. I was ready to go with this kernel. Um, there's more, I've, I've given you a little link there on my website. I wrote an article about this for uh, ProLight and Sound News that goes more into depth how it happened on the day at Red Rocks. But suffice to say, the show kernel these two show kernels have been leapfrogging. Every time I add something to my workflow in one artist, I want to add it to the other. And it doesn't matter which artist you're working with, it's a familiar programming environment. <clears throat> so show kernel concept is reusable. Something you do for one artist might be available to another artist. Most artists have a drum kit, <laughs> no matter how big or small it is. You're going to be using different types of lights. I recommend Martin products. They're great. Um, and you also uh, have, you, 
you're going to have a guitar player, you might have an acoustic player. In my show file, I have at least a six inhibitors programmed for front lights. Uh, if I go from artist to artist, I can just relabel those groups and keep those fixtures in my uh, fixture schedule. They're already labeled as a key light layer, and they have this extra infrastructure within my programming, like these inhibitors. Uh, things that you're going to use in every show. Hazer buttons, hazer timer sequences, house lights. Sometimes they say, hey, you have control of the house lights, patch these 12 dimmers. Well, I have a handle for that. It's ready to go whenever I need it. Uh, you might even uh, want to add in stuff that you use at every corporate, like here's a podium look and a general stage wash so that we don't have to have two show files. You can use my show file for the introduction that your corporate guy is going to do for the show. So these things you can place in that show kernel. Whenever I start a new artist or start reprogramming a, a, my, an art, existing artist, I'll take my most current show file clear out all the Q information, but a lot of those fixture layers might stay the same and just get modified. There's seven places instead of six on stage, something like that. And don't forget, you can always add elements to your show kernel. You're not stuck with just that kernel. The better your show kernel is, the more time you have on the day to mess with new things. For instance, you can see in this uh, example here, there's a bunch of X bars running along the back and up and down, and there's a bunch of lasers. I had control over all these things. Because I had the show programmed for all the other fixtures, I had lots of time to add in programming for these X bars and for the lasers. And I could deal with this one special show that we did at the Ace Theater in LA for a TV show. I could use what I already had make it special to that night, and then I took that programming from the X-Bars and kept it in the console. Lo and behold, I got to use it as a, at a festival like two months later. So remember, you can always add these elements, and you can decide how long they're going to be clinking around in your show file. But uh, just because I'm telling you to come up with a list of essentials doesn't mean you're not going to think about, oh, in this song, I'm going to light it only with these mirrors. Well, because there's a mirror ball, for instance. Um, you have more time to say, yeah, there's a mirror ball in this place, and it would actually work in the song. So I'm going to do that mirror ball look, because the rest of the show's already done, as long as I've gotten through those cloning checklists. Yeah? Um, and I think we can all agree that the best look that everyone has, no matter who you are, is everybody holding the damn cell phones. I hated this when it started, but now it seems like every show there's a moment that's it's appropriate. And it's something that we all share together. So there you go. There is one piece that everybody's kernel should have. Pick up your phone, wave it around, and get those people to turn on their lights, because it's, it's awesome every time you do it. So let me just wrap this whole thing up. What is the show kernel? Well, it evolved to accommodate any artist performing in all kinds of different circumstances. Um, it's a package of information. It's all this intellectual property that contains the DNA of what makes your show your show. Careful preparation of said kernel will give you the confidence and the time to deal with stuff that happens in the moment that might be different. It's a live performance. You're there for a reason, not to just send this package off and let some other person do it. You know, this is, this is your stuff. Uh, the organization of worlds and stuff like that that I was mentioning will allow you to program stuff on a day using a foreign rig that you can use later on and keep that going for as long as you want within your show file. And remember, if you're using confetti, make sure a leaf blower is part of that show kernel. Uh, that's a picture of my kid trying to keep the stuff off the console in the finale of the show. Great time. Um, so. Next, uh, I have another webinar coming up, and this show kernel idea is what we use when we advance. My next one's called The Art of the Advance, and it talks about using these documents and the back and forth that happens with you and the local host that you're going to visit. So I hope that people can join me for that. I believe it's May 29th, um, and uh, I'd just like to say thank you to Brad Schiller. He's the guy who turned me on to this. He told Laura that I would be a good candidate, so thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you to Martin for putting these on again. Thank you very much to those who have already done some of these seminars. Uh, I, I think that Paul Rutherford's and uh, Robin Seafelt's webinars were great. Again, Robin told the story that I just told from the other end of the snake. This is what you should do for a guest LD is what she said. Well, here's what the guest LD can do to make Robin's life better. So thanks again. Please visit my website, drop me an email, and uh, thanks for attending or catching up. And I, it's a small audience I know. So many of the people who've attended are people that I may uh, know very well or people that have, have, have met me over the years. Thanks again, and I hope that uh, this information helps you. Time for doing it. Okay, thank you, AJ. We do have some questions, if you're open to taking questions now. 100%. Um, okay, wonderful. So the first question is asking, um, if you could pick a ground package for a baby band, maybe an act headlining clubs or supporting the theaters, what kind of gear would you start with, such as themes, spots, washes, strobes, eye candy, et cetera, um, and say you could only bring a few dozen fixtures with you? Okay. Um, quick answer is, <laughs> it's your show, man. <laughs> but uh, I always start with, for a floor package, I would think of uh, LED wash lights first uh, because they're usually on the lower expense, sort of like the, the Mac Aura, the perfect little workhouse, work, uh, workhorse. And uh, the new one that they came out with, I can't wait to see it, haven't seen it for real yet. Uh, wash lights really, you know, they, they give you uh, a lot of bang for your buck, but when you're talking about bring your own floor package, that is the part that you can control. Uh, in the One Republic set, it's those LED risers I was showing you. So uh, the, the rest of the show kernel is to come up with the ideas you're going to use on the slightly unknowns, on the fixtures that you're not sure what they're going to be. The floor package that you bring, that's the time to specify like a magic blade or some uh, other, some Martin version there, <laughs> like, uh, or to, to specify some really cool fixtures because you have total control and they're always going to be the same, or at least every chance that you can convince them to take the truck to the gig. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, wonderful. Um, the next question is, uh, says, I'm unclear on why and how it works only with channel numbers in the original world stage. Aha, uh -huh. okay. The channel numbers thing is almost a whole like 20 minute discussion in and of itself. It's a trick I picked up, picked up from someone. Um, the, the idea just being that you have, a, you have um, a quick way to separate your incoming local fixtures from the fixtures that are in your original. And that's the only reason I make that differentiation. Um, could you just read the question again quickly? The, Something about a small yeah. thing? Sure. It says, I'm unclear on why and how it works only with channel numbers in the original world slash stage. Okay. So that's that's what I'm trying to uh, answer there. And um, uh, it, it's this is definitely one of those things that I can show you in front of a console because I could scroll around really quickly and, and, and show you why. But it's that idea that you're that on the one side, I'm hold, holding my hand here. This is the side of your originals. And then when you bring in, you partial show read, the, uh, the guest rigs patch, your, their fixtures are down here and they don't have any over, overlapping IDs. And the way that they certainly don't have any over, overlapping IDs, even if they have the same number, one's a 301 and the other's a 301, mine is a channel 301, theirs is a fixture 301. And it's just a way of keeping them separate. You don't have to do it every time. It's a trick. So I hope that sort of explains it. And if someone wants to send me an email on that, I'll try to give them an even better explanation. Okay, great. We have another question. Um, how do you approach fixtures in a multi-instance mode when preparing the clone information? Ah, that's a real fun one. Um, <clears throat> when you're referring to a multi-instance fixture, Almost always we're talking about a fixture that has a point one that is the, the head and then a bunch of individual instances which are the cells. And that's a wonderful way that, that it's uh, separated on the, on the MA2. Um, 
you can clone, for instance, let's, I'll give you an example, and maybe this will, this will help. Um, if I was going to clone a wash light, uh, a, a Mac Quantum in basic mode that doesn't have access to the three rings to a Mac Quantum in multi-instance mode, in extended mode, where you have access to those three rings, now we're dealing with, it's actually, um, four. it's five instances, it's the head, the three rings, and then there's the aura as well that you have to deal with. So your single instance fixture of the basic has pan and tilt information. You basically do the clone twice. You have to clone from your head to the 0.1 instance of your Mac extended, okay? So you clone from your, your basic fixture to the 0.1 instance. That takes care of all of the overall intensity coming up and down. Uh, it takes care of the pan and tilt and the shutter of that head. And then you have to do another cloning run where you take your basic and clone to the three instances that are those rings. So now you're dealing with more fixtures, but you do have red, green, blue information from your original basic. You're just multiplying it now on those other fixtures and they'll behave like a unit. You basically end up doing the clone twice. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, how much time away from production do you spend building, editing the elements of your show kernel? Do you often update it at home? Yes, uh, I would say I've been with One Republic since 2014, that's six years, and I would say and I've reprogrammed from scratch, just said I'm throwing this out, see if I come up with the same ideas or come up with some new ones. I've done that at least two times. Um, and yeah, I'll, um, the best time I find is right when the gig finishes and the, maybe the plane ride home or, or, or shortly thereafter is to delete their, uh, delete the patch that you imported, get back to reset your show file and then look at maybe some programming ideas that I had from before. It's a, it's, it's a constant process. Sometimes it means two days of wood shedding and just programming, programming, and then other times it's just like, hey, a little update. The, the fact that we have the entire lighting console in our portable computers with us means you can touch it up, you can work on that show kernel, and it's going to help you again later, no matter what the context. So the answer to the question really is, I'm always working on my kernels. Okay, we have another question. Um, for your Red Rocks gigs that you said you were able to exploit programming from the first band to use on the second band, can you expand on this? For example, did you simply PSR the patch and presets for the extra fixtures, or was there more to it? Okay, interesting question. And uh, yeah, I, if I had expanded on this, then the webinar would have been twice as long. But uh, I understand what's being said there. See, uh, the programming didn't doesn't really translate as in, in the in the same way. But the uh, the the tasks that were similar to both artists made it so that I could design a rig that accommodated them both. So each of their show kernels had a great host on which to play. The questioner does bring up an interesting idea though, what programming could, have I, could I have used from what artist to the next? I believe I did try to PSR the positions I had on the rocks, for instance, of some of the moving lights on the rocks, so I didn't have to do that twice. But a better example of this would be going into a festival where that person has provided you with the show file and those layouts that I talked about, and so you got their patch and everything, you PSR that, but they've also spent all night making up some really good audience positions, and you don't have a lot of time. They've covered the whole, uh, there's a 100 lights they've used to cover the whole audience, and maybe they've come up with some cool aerial effects that you want, might want to use as position in your show. You can import those and then just selectively say, okay, uh, embed those as presets. Uh, you, can, you can PSR those particular uh, position presets separately. Likewise, you can PSR the global presets that that person might have already worked on to give you some, some, some extra presets. Uh, however, the, in the Red Rocks instance, it was more of a case of the rig that I had to design accommodated both show kernels so they were both easy to perform. 
Okay, this is follow up to that. Um, an individual is asking, do you feel that PSR is much better than cloning? They're two completely different things. Uh, PSR is to get that information in this context, in this workflow. Uh, the, the cloning is going to have to happen anyway. It's the only way that you, they, they, they work in tandem, but I wouldn't say there's a difference between PSR and cloning. So I think that, uh, um, yeah, they're not the okay. same thing. <laughs> okay, we have another question. Um, your layout with the start button, what macros does that trigger and what does it do when you hit start? Ah, okay. Uh, what it does is it uh, it actually turns off all sequences and effects and everything, so the console is kind of like just plain. It runs that base queue that I was talking about. All of my show song macros, everything runs that base queue, so that that underlying this is where the lights are focused to begin with. Um, that runs, and then it puts me on the test page and selects the focus uh, sequence and runs that that calibration blue check pan tilt queue. So all those things are in there. There's the other macro that you saw was the start show and that turns off all that stuff, runs the base queue again, and then puts us at the top of the set list. Uh, and then I have a whole way that way that, that works. But the uh, it's again, just as I'm using the uh, focus sequence as a checklist to make sure I've done all my homework on the day, that start day macro just, it's a snapshot of what the day should start like, and that's my beginning point of every day. Okay, next question. When going to festivals or corporate events, do you proceed forward with your kernel or start back after each show with your base? Okay, uh, the fact that the questioner used the word base, the base is a separate part of the kernel. Base is that, that base queue, and that's a programming thing. Uh, but to answer the question directly, um, I, I reset in that I will clean out whatever lights I had to import for the last gig. But remember, if I was doing some programming on a guest gig and I wanted to use that programming in future shows, I would just enter the full world and make sure that I'm programming both today's fixtures and those originals. And then that you're updating the kernel as you go that way. And then that way I'm starting with the new thing. I, the concept of moving forward that way happened when I first was having, let's say 10 years ago, and cloning to new rigs all the time, there'd be a moment in the day when I said, okay, that's it. Any new programming I do today, I won't be able to preserve. I won't be able to merge into my originals because I don't have the time or I don't have, you know, so th that show file, I'd have to repro redo any programming that I did once I deleted all those fixtures. Uh, coming up with the two worlds idea, where you have an original world, a today world, and a full world, and the ability to go into that full world and program both sets of fixtures at the same time, that's what allows the kernel to grow, no matter whether you're doing a corporate show or you're on tour for a while or, or any other circumstances. Okay, we have another question. How do you handle changing from color mixing to non-color mixing fixtures? Aha, uh -huh. the uh, the MA2 is pretty smart at doing that. Like, if you've mixed a blue and you go to a Mac 500, it's often going to find you the right color that's close enough. But if you don't like that color, you're still going to go through that list that I was talking about. That list will be bringing up that color preset. So as long as you make sure on a on an MA2 you you're going to make sure that you're, there's a color wheel uh, channel programmed in your presets, um, but that's, uh, it, that's generally, generally there. There's a color mode or something like that, and uh, the, the console does half the work. The global presets are key to ma making them, uh, that programming show up everywhere, making that color show up in the rest of the show. But your, that list that I was talking about where you're checking all the presets, you're going to check those colors anyway. So if the blue's not quite blue, you can fiddle around. You might end up having three colors that use the same, same color in the color wheel because that's the closest thing. But as long as you update that, you'll know that those colors are going to come up correctly during the show. All right, the next question is asking, when you come in and start up the console, how do you test all 
all the lights that you have control? Um, the uh, any test cues that you have, that any test sequence that you program is going to get cloned. <laughs> so when you when you clone your fixtures, they'll show up in in those uh, those those testing presets that you might have, testing sequences, for instance. Um, for me, it's that moment when uh, that, that pressing that start day, again, puts all the lights pointing a direction, uh, the same direction, in the same color, with a similar beam size, and I can see right away whether or not that cloning information has happened correctly, because I'll have control over those, those lights, uh, task by task, as I clone them. Um, but, you know, it's the same way that you would test any rig. Uh, some people just like to grab things in the programmer and move them around. Other people will program complicated test sequences. I prefer the latter because that way you can say, yep, there you go. Here's all your lights testing and they're going, they're cycling through presets. Um, so once they're cloned properly, those presets will test the light like they would have when you were programming. Hope that answers it. It looks like that was the last question. So thank you so much, AJ. We really appreciate you presenting today and look forward to your next presentation. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to AJ, I believe his contact information is up on the screen there for you. Um, and once again, this session was recorded, so we will be sending out the recording of this in several days, and it will also be posted out on our YouTube channels. Um, if you're interested in upcoming sessions, you can find those on pro.harman.com. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We appreciate it. Have a great day.